peace that Father, they want to find Father in you, a ready ally as they, uh, as they work in the place of their calling. Father, we pray, Lord, that uh, they would come with, with peace in their heart. And Father, grounded in your grace and your love and your truth in Christ, Father, that would be a fragrance of life in the places you have put them. Father, I pray, Lord, that, that this turn, Father, that, that will be filled with stories, Father, of how you have worked amazing things in the lives of people of children and their families. Father, I want to thank you for the love this group, Father, of people working in education have for those that they uh, connect with. I pray, Lord, that that might bear everlasting fruit this term we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're up. Um, We're sort of doing a series on following Jesus. We started a few weeks ago. And um, for those of you who were with us last week, you will know that this passage comes straight after where we were. For those of you who were not here last week, uh, we have it recorded for you, a video. It will take a little longer than half an hour to look at that. For those of you who like to read, we have it printed copy of my sermon, almost complete word for word, if you are a reader, you can do that. Um, living as a Christian is the necessary vital accompaniment to believing in Jesus. One reflects the other. For the theologically minded and those who like the theological jargon, Justification comes before sanctification, but justification empowers sanctification. We've got a lot to get through this morning, so I don't want to waste time. <clears throat> Hopefully something useful will arise from God as he uh, speaks to those who are listening. We're going to pray, and then we're going to read Ephesians 5, 1 through to 20. Father God. We thank you for this time, Father, to come under your word. We thank you for uh, your amazing grace that you've given us your word. Father, I pray, Lord, that you might give us ears to hear. Father, thank you that your word is living and powerful. That's able to, to get right down deep into our hearts. I pray that you might do that today. We come, we bow before you, we ask work in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be mentioned among you, as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness or foolish talk or vulgar joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person, which amounts to an idolater, as an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. See that no one deceives you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them, for once you were, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth as you try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed to the light, for everything that has become visible 
is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So then, be careful how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, in which there is debauchery, but be filled with the, with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God and Father, to our God and Father. I love how it starts. Do you love how it starts? It's beautiful. Imitate God as his children. Imitate God as his children. I'm reminded of, of uh, John's words in his first letter. In verse three, chapter 3, verse 1, he says this. He says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Aren't they wonderful? That's wonderful, isn't it? Don't you think? Or do you think like, oh, that's just, who cares? Who cares about that? The children of God, oh well, whatever. I need coffee. Eh? Imitating God is to walk in love. Note that love in this sense is defined by Jesus giving himself for us. In him being an aroma, a sacrifice to God. The fragrant aroma is reminiscent of incense, not the stuff we might see at the Buddhist temple or whatever. But the Jewish people used to use incense in their worship. Yeah? Paul writes in his second letter to the Corinthians, he writes this in chapter four, chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. That thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us reveals the fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of God, of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death, to an to an to the other an aroma from life to life. There's a whole lot in there and stuff we won't go through today, but, but this sense of being an aroma, this sense of a fragrance is a, a beautiful thing, an offering to God. Therefore, the love that we live out of is the love that Jesus shows both to us and how he offered himself to the Father. It is the love of sacrifice, the love of putting another first, the love from God's agenda and not from our own. In times past, we would have just stopped there, perhaps, perhaps tell a story or two, not elaborate on what that meant. We would say, walk in love, but not give concrete examples. After all, we can all read what Paul writes. We can all understand what God says later. And while I don't want to undo the good done by that, I do want to say that by not being specific, by not waiting on God, we've allowed people, people who look very much like me and very much like you, we've allowed us to elude the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So it's important for the development of disciples that we ask in the light of what has gone on before in Ephesians, so Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, how does this love work its way out in my life? How does the love that God tells us to walk in, how does that work its way out in our life? Paul begins by giving us the negative. Not much fun of you, Paul. We would like the positive, please. We don't like the negative. But Paul starts the negative. If you, the love you walk in is not like this, he says. 
And you start with the negative because you've already made the case that we, those who hope in Jesus, he's already made the case that those who hope in Jesus have access to the resurrection life of Jesus. He's already made the case for that. You want to find out about that? Ephesians 1 talks about that. Talks about how we have the resurrection life. That's his prayer for us. That we'll know the power of God's re- of the resurrection life in our, in our life. The same power that God used when he raised Jesus from the dead. Paul says, that's what I want for you. And that's what you have in Christ. He's already made the foundation for that. So he starts with the negative. A few weeks ago, we talked about Paul's prayer for power from Ephesians 3. The power to have Jesus dwell in us so that our lives are a fitting home for him. The power to live life accordingly. To know how high and wide and deep and how long is the love of Christ. And to grow to full maturity in Christ Jesus. We, we talked about that. Whatever ethical commands Paul makes, it is on the basis that in Christ Jesus we have resurrection life. And while Paul is certainly a product of his time and his culture, the things that make for sexual immorality, impurity and greed in verse 3 are not culturally defined. He knows what the Greek mind thinks. He knows the Hebrew sensibilities and what they might picture. But it's what God thinks and what God feels that are important to Paul. And so it continues to be for us. What is proper for the saints is defined by God and what is pleasing to Jesus. Sexual immorality, impurity and greed, filthiness, foolish talk and vulgar joking are not what God desires for his children. Jesus did not rise from the dead so that we could remain in them. This is a word for the 21st century, isn't it? Sexual immorality, impurity, greed, foolish talk, vulgar joking are common. Not only, I suspect, in the world, but in the church too. We live in a hypersexualized age where sex is depicted as a harmless, lovely, simple, natural please, a pleasure between consenting people. That's how sex is viewed in our world. You turn on the television, there it is. It's the same thing. That's how it is. Paul writes in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians, Chapter 6, verse 18, it says, Flee sexual immorality because it is a sin against our own body. In, a, in his blog titled, A Sin Against Yourself, Dr. Tim Chester says this about sexual in- intimacy. God designed sex as a way to give yourself to another. The clothes come off, so you're exposed. You give your body to the embrace of another. You enter or are entered. Your very self is fused to another. You are glued together. The two become one. And that is the truth behind every sexual act. Everyone. That's the truth behind marriage. And that's great in a committed relationship between a man and a woman the Baptists call marriage. It's not so great outside of marriage, where people might go from one person to another person to another. To split that which is joined together in sexual union is to damage the whole person. Our sense of value, our identity and purpose, in addition to hurting our physical body. And if we don't think this matters very much, then we need to hear Paul again. He introduces something to us in verse 5 that we find really uncomfortable. In the context of what he's been talking about, Paul says that no sexually immoral, impure or greedy person which amounts to an idolater 
as an inheritance in the kingdom of God, kingdom of Christ and God. We don't like to talk about consequences like this. We understand, though, that it's not just by our deeds that we become such a person, but we become that person by the things we treasure in our hearts. But when we read scriptures like this, we want to read them really quickly. We want to get back to the love and the grace bits. They're much more fun, much nicer to us. But, but let's stay with this a little longer. Paul says that if we're sexually immoral, if we're impure, if we're a greedy idolater, we will not inherit the kingdom of God in Christ. But we ask, what of grace and what of faith? What of forgiveness and what of the new covenant? Those things are vital and important. In Paul's letter to Timothy, he says that it's through God's grace we've learned to say no to ungodliness. The writer to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 12 to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and in doing so to rid ourselves of every obstacle and sin that so easily entangles us. Complete and utter forgiveness of sins, the cleansing of our conscience, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit are promises of the new covenant and as such are vital for godliness and holiness. They're vital to our very life, our very being. But one cannot serve both God and money. One cannot remain sexually immoral and impure in any of the ways in which God's Word presents it and claim godliness as well. Something has to give. There is only one God. We might experience temptation. We might even stumble and fall in areas of our life. We might still have sin that seems so impossible to get rid of. But if we're going to ask the, answer the question, how do we walk in love, we also need to ask, who is really on the throne in our heart? We're drilling deep now. Yeah. We're not just going to wash over this. We're going to the core of the matter. Who is really on the throne of your heart? Is it the one who reigns in glory now, who has ascended into heaven and who will one day return? He's the one who needs to be reigning on the throne of your heart now. And he must reign in our heart, not just in words or lip service, not just in songs we sing on a Sunday or we listen to the radio, in the car, or whatever. But in attitude and action as well. He must be the one we're devoted to. He must be the one we obey, who we love. Not the fleeting pleasure of sin that comes through sexual immorality, impurity, and greed. But we might think, we might think that what we do in this flesh but is soon to disappear, doesn't really matter. We might think that the only thing that really matters is our spirit, our soul, because that's the only thing that goes on forever. So the deeds in our flesh, our appetites, for the pleasures of sin, luxury and things, including money, they'll all fade away, they're all meaningless, but Jesus forgives us anyway. But if we believe that, we would be mistaken. Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus was raised in the flesh. Because the flesh, his body, matters. What we do in our flesh, in our body, matters. In fact, it matters so much that we will be judged for what we do in it and what we do to it. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 19 and 20 that do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? 
and you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Can I say that in some ways, pastors and Bible teachers have failed in this matter? Can I say that we've majored on the spiritual and minored on the physical? Some of that's because we're afraid of teaching law. But in doing so, we've forgotten that sanctification follows justification. Well, none of us believe that the material is immaterial, we have by the sheer volume of what we preach and teach given precedence to our spiritual person, I just expect that to flow into our physical self all on its own. But we are not built like that. We are not built like that. Paths need to be made. Our bodies, our minds, our emotions, our will needs to be brought into submission to Jesus who sits on the throne. Maybe that's why we struggle to read the Bible or pray or serve without reward. And so given the seriousness of what God is saying to us, Paul says, don't think that this stuff doesn't really matter. He writes in verse 6, See that no one deceives you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You know, vain and empty words have been seeking to, to deceive the children of God since Adam and Eve and their encounter with the serpent in the garden. But just for a moment, let's put legs on this. If you're a Christian and been a Christian for a while, you would have heard the devil whisper in your ears, it's okay to indulge in that sin, because Jesus will forgive you anyway. He already has. So why not? Why not do it? In fact, you've already committed it, committed it in your heart anyway, otherwise you wouldn't be wanting it. So just do it. You know you want to. Whatever voice you've heard those words in, they are the words of the devil. Of course, there's some truth hidden in there, otherwise it would not have the power to deceive. Jesus does indeed forgive our every sin. There are not some he doesn't forgive. His blood doesn't run out for us. His grace is not like a bottle you buy at the shop. Oh, I've run out of money, I can't get any more. But deception is a distortion of the truth. The devil is saying that sin doesn't matter. Those who have said these words to you are saying sin doesn't matter. If you haven't heard that one, perhaps you maybe have heard that Jesus forgives everyone. Everyone in the end will be forgiven. That Jesus loves everyone so much, he'll forgive everyone. Everyone will get there in the end. It's okay. Regardless of what they've done, what they will do, doesn't matter. Jesus loves them so much and nothing can overcome his love for them. The devil is saying sin doesn't matter. Those who preach this false gospel say sin doesn't matter. But even worse, is that they're saying the cross doesn't matter. That Jesus' death and resurrection was for nothing. They're saying that God is not holy, he's not righteous. That his love is simply fairy dust and sugar. His wrath, the fiction, and his judgments untrue. Lies aren't really bad, aren't they? Paul calls them darkness. While you once may have followed philosophies of folly, you do so no more. See how Paul is full of hope for his readers? In verse 8, he writes, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
For the fruit of the life consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. As you try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. While we might have been like them, now we are light in the Lord. We once walked in darkness. Now he encourages us to walk as children of light, practicing goodness, righteousness and truth. Resurrection life is what God calls us to. <clears throat> we once lived as Gentiles. We live like that no more. Rather, we learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And I know probably through practice rather than revelation that when we get really busy with life, things get on top of us. You should see teachers in week nine. And you know all about it. Things get on top. We let things slide in our life. Give ourselves a day off from praying intentionally, from reading the Bible, from pursuing what pleases God with respect to our particular situation. We find it hard to say no when people ask us to do things, to help them and to serve them, especially family. We find it hard to say no, I haven't got time. No, I'm too busy. We cease paying attention to who's at the wheel in our life. We find that it's our friends, our family, our work who are at, at the wheel of our life. But we never stay still in this life. We're either moving one way or we're moving the other. We're either running towards Christ Jesus. We're either keeping in step with the Holy Spirit or sitting in love with Jesus in heavenly places or we're moving away from Him. We'll be listening to another voice in the shadows, listening to empty words and vain promises. So Paul uses this quote from Isaiah 61 to, to help us at the right time. Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. followers of Jesus who should be fully awake, who should be fully aware of who's on the throne of our hearts, who's at the wheel of our lives, Paul begins to set the stage for positive instruction. He says, be careful how you walk, be wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. To make the most of our time is a reference to making Christ Jesus known in attitude action and word as individuals and as a community, a church, the body of Christ. Why are the days evil? Not because God's creation is evil, but because time is running out for us, for people, and indeed for creation as it groans under the weight of our sin. There's an urgency that appears in this letter as it does in the rest of the New Testament. And while some believe that Paul and the rest of the writers of the New Testament believe that Jesus was coming, within, returning within their lifetime, it really doesn't matter so much. Because Jesus didn't know when he was coming. The intent is so that we might be urgent. That we might have a sense of his return and a knowledge that the days are evil, that people need to be brought into the light. That this time is not going to be forever. But that's not the only way the days are evil. Our time in our flesh is limited, as is our energy and ability. Time ravages us. So we need to make the most of every opportunity to be wise and not waste our time with foolish endeavours. It is foolishness to build up treasure where moth and rust destroy. It is foolish to think that apart from God we might gain essential wisdom for our lives in this world. 
It is foolish to think that we can never know the will of God for our lives, for his church, or even for this city. The whole command to walk in love turns on us being filled with the Holy Spirit. And to go on being filled. The negatives here give way to positives. The don'ts and do's become commands to sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. To make melody in our hearts to the Lord. To give him thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our God and Father. It's a reminder. If we want to walk in love. If we want to walk in the spaces that God is carving out for us in this city, we must continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. And haven't we been crying out for that here in this place? Hasn't that been on our lips all last year and all the year before? Isn't that what we want in revival and renewal? And haven't they been our prayer for so long? And won't they continue to be so. But the Spirit will only fill us for His continuing purposes if we want Jesus on the throne of our lives. Lots of us have been Christians for a long time. So really, we need to get serious about this. We need to walk in the light, drag out of shameful deeds from the closets and recesses of our hearts where we've been quietly nurturing them against all good sense and all good teaching, against all that we claim to know and believe, against all that we want to happen in our lives. Drag them out into the light. God's Holy Spirit is that which raised Christ Jesus from the dead. It is resurrection power. It is resurrection life. God's Holy Spirit is that power of God that we need if we're going to walk in love just as Jesus walked in love. If our lives are characterised by the sins that Paul talks about here in this passage, or if our hearts are kept captive to vain and empty teaching that what we do in our bodies doesn't matter, that sin doesn't matter, then we have an opportunity to respond to the call of God on our life. We will feel embarrassed. We will feel a sense of shame because we should have known better. We should have done this a long time ago. We should have got rid of this stuff out of our life ages ago. But God does not intend to shame us. He intends to Free us from sin and its power. It is sin that shames us. So I encourage you, ask you, respond to God's call in whatever way you feel He's calling you. If Matt comes up to close our service. Father God, we want to thank you so much that your word is alive and living. Father, we pray, Lord, that you might help us to grab hold of this, to hide it away in our hearts, to allow your word to do its work in us. The Father, we won't lock doors of our hearts to your word. The Father will allow it to do its work, to drag out into the light the stuff that we've been hiding. That, Father, we might be filled with your spirit over and over again. Father, the promise, Father, your spirit is given to those who will obey you. And so, Father, we can respond to your call. Come, we're working us, we pray. In Jesus' name.